Many of you have heard me say before that in addition to our seven principles and six sources of Unitarian Universalism, we should consider having a seventh source, our own UU history and heritage. While continuing to seek wisdom from wherever we can find it, from the world's religions, from modern science, from our own direct experience, we should also recognize our tradition's homegrown resources. After all, the Unitarian half of our heritage stretches back to the 1500s in Europe, and the Universalist half of our heritage and roots go back to the 1700s here in North America. And I occasionally like to share a history-focused sermon with you because, as the saying goes, we did not make ourselves, or we stand on the shoulders of giants, so that if we can see more than they or things at a greater distance, it is not by any virtue of sharpness of sight on our part or any physical distinctions, but because we are carried high and raised up by their giant sides. The freedom and pluralism that we enjoy today is no accident, but was hard won by those who came before us. And the invitation of studying the past is not only gratitude for the courage and fortitude of those who came before us, but also to consider what the parallels might be to today. How might we do likewise that others might stand on our shoulders? And as many of you know, I'm, I'm doing a few more over kind of January to May, a few more history-based sermons than normal because I'm co-teaching UU History and Polity at Wesley Theological Seminary this spring. So I'm trying to share a little bit of, of insights from that class without going into your know, three-hour lectures up here. But the uh, for those of you who are tired of history, don't worry. There's only I think there's one more in a few weeks history-based sermon, and then one more in May, and then we're then we're done for a while. So. <laughs> There's light at the end of the tunnel for those who are, are if anybody's tired of history, but try to keep it interesting. And in that spirit, I'd like to share with you this morning some about the life and legacy of our Unitarian forebear, Theodore Parker, who has been called the most influential minister in the entire U.S. in the mid-19th century. As you heard earlier in the spoken meditation, Parker was minister of the 28th Congregational Society. Now, that's not a very uh, innovative name, but you know, you kind of think of First Presbyterian or Second Baptist Church. Well, this is the 28th Congregational Society because this is Boston, right? It's, it's UU Mecca. And then, you know, you know, the joke is that in the 19th century, Unitarianism was about the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, and the neighborhood of Boston. So <laughs> that's kind of what we're dealing with and why we have the 28th Congregational Society. And at that time, it was the largest free church in the country and the largest church of any kind in Boston. In the 1850s, almost 3,000 people went weekly to hear Parker um, preach. Uh, that's about 2 to 3 percent of the entire population of Boston was coming to that music hall every week. Some 50,000 listened to him lecture um, each year in lyceums that stretched from Maine to Illinois. Meanwhile, thousands more bought his published sermons and addresses, which were uh, found readers on both sides of the Atlantic. Scholars and thinkers took his work seriously, and he could read more than 20 languages, as Laura said earlier. Though he kind of get, as he traveled some, he kind of got surprised, like he'd been teaching French for decades, then he went to France and couldn't speak, interact very well with the people. You know, it's different. It's one thing to read French, it's another thing to, to, to speak it. Famously, Parker's turn of phrase from his election sermon in 1846 of government of, of all, by all, and for all, that that floated down to President Lincoln. It was uh, incorporated into the conclusion of his Gettysburg Address 17 years later of government of the people, by the people, for all the people. Similarly, see if you can hear the well-known saying that emerged out of this passage from Parker. He wrote, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The ark is a long one. My eye reaches but a little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight, but I can divine it by conscience. That's a very transcendentalist notion. I can't see it, but I can divine it by my conscience. My conscience shows me the ark in the moral universe. And he continued, and from what I see, I am sure that it bends toward justice. 
Martin Luther King Jr. shortened that quote to, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. That's from his famous speech where he said, how long? Not long. How long? Not long. And then added in that, that phrase about the arc of the moral universe. And that version by Dr. King was one of a few phrases selected by President Obama to weave into uh, the Oval Office, to the rug in the Oval Office that sits there today. But its origins lie with that 19th century abolitionist and Unitarian minister, minister Theodore Parker. Now, I've shared with you previously about the even more uh, radical and activist second half of Parker's career. If you go back and look at our sermon archives, there was a sermon called The Secret Six. And the Secret Six are the ones who helped fund and supply John Brown's reign on nearby Harper's Ferry at the Federal Armory there. The, uh, and of the Secret Six, five were Unitarians, two were Unitarian ministers. Uh, Parker also famously kept, he let people know that he kept a gun in the drawer of his desk study. He was part of helping the resistance to the Fugitive Slave Law, helping with the Underground Railroad, and so he uh, let people know he, he was not opposed to using violence, let's say. Uh, <clears throat> but for this morning, I'd like to focus on the first half of Parker's career through around the mid-1840s, in which he became a leader in the Transcendentalist movement. The definitive biography of this half of Parker's life, if you're interested in learning more, is by that UU historian Dean Grogston that Daniel, Daniel read from earlier, and it's titled American Heretic, Theodore Parker in Transcendentalism. Grogston writes that despite his fame, Parker was neither tall nor handsome. His big head was bald. Uh, as she said earlier, the nicer way of saying it is he had a large forehead. I think it's what the, the meditation said. Uh, his, face, his features on his long face were plain. His voice was deep and resonant, but not especially strong. Apparently those 3,000 people in the uh, music hall had to sit very still. They had to put their newspapers away once he came in and listened very closely for a full hour. I'll not be speaking for an hour this morning. Uh, but that his impact came instead from the force of his complex personality, from the power of his prose, and the strength of his ideas. Although today most people have never heard of Parker, who essentially had, you know, maybe heard the name but doesn't know it, didn't know anything about Parker before this morning. That's really not surprising. That for nearly a century after, after his untimely death at age 49 in the year 1860, interest in him was really high around the world for a whole century. Two collected editions of his works were published, a 14-volume set in London, a 15-volume edition in Boston. I mean, if people are publishing 14, 15-volume sets of, your, of what you had to say and thought about, that's a fairly a high indication of interest. His works were translated into German, Swedish, and Japanese, of all languages. In addition to multiple biographies about him written in English, uh, biographies were also, original biographies were also written about him in French, in German, and in Dutch. The centennial of Parker's birth in 1910 was marked by major celebrations, but he began to be forgotten for a confluence of reasons in the mid-20th century. The opportunity is to reclaim his legacy both of racial justice work as well as a bold inquiry into being willing to ask the hard questions of theology and philosophy. Another significant part of Parker's legacy is his commitment to transforming the institution of the church. Although Ralph Waldo Emerson is surely the most famous 19th century Unitarian minister, Emerson was actually only a Unitarian minister for just a handful of years before he left the ministry for the Lyceum circuit to, to speak. But Parker stayed and gives us insight into what it looks like not just to be an individual speaking for change and calling for change, but someone trying to harness the power of a congregation, of a group, and of larger networks to work for social justice. And Parker's life reminds us that transcendentalism was about a lot more than just Thoreau living by himself in the woods. And of course, Thoreau was actually living on Emerson's property and having dinner with him every night. That's a, he was really that isolated. That's another, that's another sermon. Uh, but Parker's life reminds us about that transcendentalism was also about infusing progressive, cutting-edge religious thought into congregational life. That being said, allow me to take a brief step back and trace a little bit of the trajectory of Parker's life that got him to that point. 
He was born in 1810 in Lexington, Massachusetts, and in his family, he was the baby, as Laura mentioned, of 11 children. As my wife Megan and I look toward, we, we have what we call our hypothetical children that we talk about, and everyone keeps telling us, now, advanced maternal age starts at 35, right? That's what we're constantly hearing. But he was the last of 11 children, nine surviving brothers and sisters, ages 4 to 25. His mother was 46 when he was born, uh, his father 49. Looming large in Parker, we're not going to wait till 46 to, to try. <laughs> uh, uh, looming large in Parker's formative years was that during the Revolutionary War, it was his grandfather that, had, so I said he lived in Lexington, Massachusetts, so right near his childhood home. He constantly grew up hearing about how his grandfather had commanded the Minutemen on Lexington Green. So his grandfather, Captain Parker, had proclaimed those famous words, don't fire unless fired upon, but if they want to have a war, let it begin here. So you can see that the seeds of being a radical, of being willing to use violence if necessary to bring about social change were planted early in the psyche of the young Parker. And keep in mind historically that supporters of using violence to potentially end slavery in the years leading up to the Civil War, they were much closer historically to the Revolutionary War than we are to the Civil War. Only 84 years had passed from 1776 to 1860, whereas, whereas more than twice as much time, more than 160 years, had passed from the Civil War to today. So Parker and the other members of the Secret Six saw themselves as extending the fight for freedom that had begun in the American Revolutionary War for Independence. So just as you know, his grandfather's generation had, and father's generation had fought to throw off the yoke of British slavery, they saw themselves as, well, what our battle may be today is helping black citizens of this country throw off the yoke of enslavement. To further locate Parker historically, some of you will recall a sermon I did relatively recently about William Ellery Channing, who uh, we have our Channing Chapel here, whose 1819 sermon, Unitarian Christianity, um, helped really claim and solidify that name of Unitarianism and led to the formation in 1825 of the American Unitarian Association, which then in turn merged with the Universalist Church of America in 1961. And that's where we have the Unitarian Universalist Association that we're a part of today. Parker was only nine years old when Channing preached that landmark sermon on Unitarian Christianity. Channing, in turn, died in 1842, the year after Parker preached his own landmark sermon called The Transient and the Permanent in Christianity. You can hear that word Christianity in both of those famous sermons, and that's because in, in 19th in the Humanist influence in our movement did not really start to the early 20th century, especially like in the 1920s. So in the 19th century, Unitarianism was about um, moving toward a theologically liberal Christianity. That was the, the battle of Channing and Parker's time. And along with Emerson's Divinity School address, those three addresses from Channing, from Parker, from Emerson are easily or arguably the three most significant addresses in Unitarian history. They're all available free online you're interested in learning more. And what led to Parker's controversial sermon on the transient and the permanent in Christianity was that over the course of a decade, he found himself becoming increasingly um, liberal theologically, especially in regard to the Bible. I know that's been, uh, not for all of you, but for some of you, that, that's been your trajectory as well. And keep in mind that Darwin's paradigm shifting on the origins of the species was not published until 1859. So that's, you know, uh, the year before Parker's untimely death. So Parker was really ahead of his time even before Darwin and thinking about how are we called to evolve theologically. But if you look back at his writings as late as 1832, during his early 20s, when he was employed as a school teacher, when he couldn't afford to get into Harvard, he had to go teach school for a while. Uh, he was still a biblical literalist at that time, so it was a real um, shift over the course of about a decade. But what happened is he began to research more for himself, as, as Laura said, he couldn't get into Harvard, so he educated himself, and he also did something dangerous. He started talking to the local Unitarian minister, and you know what happens when you, when you do that. <laughs> Uh, his views, as I said, began to evolve, and by 1836, when he finally was able to graduate from Harvard Divinity School, his doubts had increased significantly about traditional teachings of Christian orthodoxy, particularly in regard to miracles. The, the idea that miracles were, were actual and historical was kind of the foundation for many people in the mid-19th century of 
why they thought Christianity was true. So as he and others began to question that, it was uh, tremendously controversial. One of the really controversial things, for example, Emerson said in his Divinity School address was that the traditional conceptions of miracles was monstrous. He did not hold that. And Parker was actually in the audience at Harvard when Emerson said those things. Emerson was then not invited back to Harvard for a few decades to speak. So it's quite ironic because at Harvard today, Emerson is revered. It's interesting how these things play out. As a result of these influences, Parker began asking increasingly bold questions. At first, he only asked them privately in his journal, and then he began to say them aloud and began to weave them into his preaching. Such as, how is Christ more a savior than Socrates? You can imagine that was uh, controversial at the time. He wrote, why did the world need a savior at all? And he began to ask kind of like those questions that sometimes children begin to ask in Sunday school, pointing out those pesky inconsistencies. He said about the resurrection, why was the body of Christ raised? Why carried up? How was the resurrection of matter proof of the immortality of the spirit? Is not the material resurrection of the body actually unspiritualizing? Good question. So, and as he dove particularly into German biblical scholarship, that was the uh, Tübingen, Germany, that was really the center of a lot of cutting-edge biblical scholarship in the 19th century. Uh, especially reading books like David Strauss's The Life of Jesus, he began to ask, is not Strauss right in the main when he says that the New Testament is a collection of myths? No doubt he goes too far, and then this may be a question some of you have found yourself asking, but pray tell, where is far enough? In the 1840s, as the Transcendentalist revolt within Unitarianism began to cause division among ministers, Parker's resolve was strengthened, and he said famously, I intend in the coming year to let out all the force of Transcendentalism that is within me, come what will. And to me, that's one of the exciting things about being a Unitarian. It's part of why I am a UU, is that you don't have to hold back. There aren't sort of verboten, forbidden questions that you can say, if you feel led to earth-centered spirituality, or to Christianity, or Judaism, or to atheism, humanism, agnosticism, that you can go fully into those traditions, or whatever combination feels meaningful to you in the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And that's part of the legacy that transcends that Transcendentalists and others like Parker leave to us. <clears throat> Significantly, the title of Parker's 1841 sermon, The Transient and the Permanent in Christianity, that's an allusion to the, an article by that German biblical scholar David Strauss on, that was titled On the Transiency and Permanency in Christianity. And it's interesting that he was willing to link himself to Strauss because Although there were risks to asking these questions in the mid-19th century, Strauss lost his professorship in, in Germany, and Parker's fortunate that that did not happen to him. He did not lose his job. But we can do that for each other. I think that's part of the invitation, is to support one another in asking the hard questions. Uh, but despite the widespread controversy that Parker's sermon did generate, no one in his congregation left or turned against him. You're all paying attention, right? So despite the controversy, no one left or turned against him. Um, essentially, he had been slowly inoculating them over the years to, to controversial uh, sermons, so that when he finally sort of really fully came out of the closet, they were like, eh. It's just part of being part of it. And his continuing successful ministry there is testament to what is possible when one not only has an individual like Emerson asking the hard questions on the you know, itinerant lecture circuit, but what is possible when a congregation wrestles with the hard questions together over time. You know, Emerson, uh, he didn't have a car warmed up, but you know, he could have the horse kind of saddled up and ready to go. So if he said something too controversial, we could get out of town and let someone else clean it up. But uh, Parker was part of a congregation. And his sermon, again, The Transient and the Permanent in Christianity, it caused widespread controversy because he didn't preach it from the safety of his home congregation. He preached it at the ordination of a new Unitarian minister. So people had traveled, you know, all the sort of dignitaries and people traveling far and wide were there. Uh, a similar dynamic will happen uh, for those of you who were able to attend my installation as the, instead of moving from contract ministry to your called settled minister on, it'll be the end of this month, Sunday the 29th at 4, right here in the sanctuary. But there'll be, I, I think, at least 20 or more Unitarian ministers and people from the larger association will be here, other local 
ministers will, so you'll get a sense of that, that palpable local connection to the larger movement that's about much more than just us here in Frederick. And that that was the occasion on which Parker preached his sermon. To give you only a taste of the sermon, it actually weighed in at about 12,000 words. So most of my sermons are about 2,000 words. We're talking about six times as long. He was, I don't know exactly how fast he spoke, but upwards of 90 minutes, I'm sure, if not getting close to two hours. But then again, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have TV. They traveled a long way, so they kind of probably wanted to make it worth the trouble. There was less competition. Uh, and one of his core points was a classic theologically liberal move, basically just saying we need to apply reason and logic to traditional religious claims and see what makes sense in light of what we knew today. And he wanted to shift attention from believing things about the historical Jesus to the truth of his teachings, irrespective of any of that. In Parker's words, it's hard to see why the great truths of Christianity rest on the personal authority of Jesus, any more than the axioms of geometry rest on the personal authority of Euclid or Archimedes. Parker's point is that Jesus' teachings were either true or false. They were either effective for making us more loving and building the beloved community and practicing forgiveness. <clears throat> they were either true or false on their own merit, irrespective of who said them. His sermon concludes, as is appropriate for an ordination, with a provocative charge to the congregation to support the freedom of the pulpit. Now, apparently his own congregation got this message, but not the people he was speaking to. Uh, so again, in Parker's words, you may prevent the freedom of speech in this pulpit, if you will. You may hire servants to preach as you bid, to spare your vices and flatter your follies, to prophesy smooth things and say there is peace when there is no peace. Yet in doing so, you only weaken and enthrall yourselves. And alas, for that one who contests to think that one thing in the closet and to preach another in this pulpit over his study and pulpit should be written emptiness. On, the, on that one's robes and that one's forehead and on right hand should be written deceit. Deceit. What a strong call to make the most of the freedom that we enjoy in this big tent of Unitarian Universalism. To not hold back in asking the hard questions of ourselves and others, but also to commit in staying in covenant and right relationship with one another for the long haul, even as we do so. And that we have both the freedom of the pulpit as well as a freedom of the pew. That I have the freedom to preach whatever I think will be helpful and beneficial for us together. But you have the freedom to either listen or not, as seems right to you. That you don't have to check your brain at the door of the church. And that everything discovered in a scientific laboratory should be brought here as well and taken into consideration. And that we don't believe in a seminary on congregation divide, the tradition in a lot of congregations for many years, and in some ways still is, that ministers learn one thing in seminary, but they don't feel comfortable saying it aloud from the pulpit. That's what Parker started to help break that down. Parker challenges us with each new generation to let go of what is transient, what has become obsolete, but to hold on to the permanency of community of covenant, and of the convictions that seem right to us as far as we can see in light of our own experience and the best current knowledge. For now, I'll give the last words to Parker for one of his attempts to redefine religion in our modern age. He wrote, be ours a religion that like sunshine goes everywhere. This isn't just something that we do on Sunday morning. It's about how we live our lives every day. Its temple, not merely one sanctuary, but all space. Its shrine, not merely one temple, but every good heart. Its creed, not one set of words carved into stone for all time and place, but all truth. And its ritual, not empty gestures, but works of love. As we continue to reflect on the life and legacy of Parker for us in our time, I invite you to rise and body your spirit and let's sing together those same words written by Parker, hymn 1058, The Hour of Religion.